Okay, I'm not sure if you guys heard Jeremy a second ago, but we are live on YouTube now. We're sending the link over to Facebook. So here in just a moment, you can go ahead and get started. And we might have a few people, a few attendees trickling in throughout because they're getting some late moment information, but that's what we've got. Okay. So stand great. by one moment. All right, All right Sue, Sue, we're ready, we're to, ready start. to start. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Good morning. I'm Joy Hoffmeister, State Superintendent of Public Instruction. We are so glad to finally be streaming live and make the connection with you. I hope you've got a cup of coffee ready um, and you are in a, a mode of just really being inspired by some students today because I'm telling you, we have got an all-star panel of students that are just gonna make your day. Um, it has been a whirlwind since March 16th, and I am so glad to be reconnecting with you. Um, if you've been a part of Engage OK conferences in past years, you might be used to joining us in a big high school auditorium this time of year. But of course, with COVID, uh, that has moved everything that we were planning to do on the road, moving from community to community to in the cloud. And we are so happy that you've joined us in this new format. We've got 30 sessions ahead through Friday, and we are confident that you are gonna find professional learning opportunities well worth your time, and perhaps even more convenient for you. And that will all prepare us for a school year that we know will be like no other, none ever and probably never like it in the, in the future. Uh, what we are facing is incredibly serious. In addition to the uncertainties and concerns about the pandemic, we know our students have sustained learning loss beyond the typical summer slide that, that we all talk about. Um, and that is due to the unprecedented ending of last school year. Uh, the only thing unknown is the degree of loss on our individual students and um, that, that individual student basis. Knowledge, as noted educator Mary McLeod Bethune said, is the prime need of the hour. Indeed it is. But against this backdrop, we face a frightening and unseen foe in COVID-19. Communities and schools may be disrupted by the virus and additional periods of remote or distance learning or virtual online for the full semester uh, could be a possibility this year, depending on the path of the coronavirus. As you know, the American Academy of Pediatrics has advocated for all policy considerations for the coming school year that, that we need to get our kids physically present in school, but we have to do it safely. It is also true that reopening school must and will be 
science driven with safety protocols that we know are based in the latest information as we are part of a novel coronavirus, we are clinging to experts. And every precaution to protect the health and well-being of all of our student community is our paramount, paramount goal. So this includes prioritizing social distancing, good hygiene, and perhaps most importantly of all, masks for our students and staff and every member that would walk in the door of any school. Before we hear from our panelists, I wanna circle back to a few additional words from Mary McLeod Bethune. The progress of the world will call for the best that all of us have to give. More than 700,000 Oklahoma public school children know they can count on your best every day and in every circumstance. And I wanna thank you. I wanna thank you for moving heaven and earth to reconnect with your students last year and your commitment, your empathy, and your amazing abilities to change lives. So I am excited to be able to now turn the conversation to the reason we all do what we do, students. This morning, I'm delighted to welcome several Oklahoma students, all members of my Student Advisory Council, who are here to discuss some very serious topics. We know you are eager to hear from them. So we'll focus the conversation on student voices. And if time permits, we're going to be combing through comments and questions that you might pose on Facebook Live. Um, and let's get started here with and uh, meet our panelists. We are joined today by these amazing students from around the state. Uh, they're going to introduce themselves as they begin speaking so that we can keep moving and get right to the conversation. Panelists, be sure to mute your mic until uh, while you are not speaking and uh, you can use the raised hand feature so that we can move really swiftly uh, with our conversation. So let's start with the obvious. Panelists, I'm curious about the impact of COVID-19 as you and your friends have experienced it. Let's get us started with what you experienced this past spring and this summer. And as you think forward, who will be first? All right, Kel, I'm calling on you. Um, I think it will be difficult to, uh, to explain what I've gone through. Um, I, I think I've been through a lot of good and bad during this time. Uh, one of the good things is, um, you know, uh, continuing to learn, doing volunteer work at the Regional Food Bank of Oklahoma or as a, in an internship. Uh, but going into the school year, um, I'm, I'm observing what I'm doing at work right now and how we're social distancing. I know there will be a lot more uh, students in the, in the school. So I'm kind of nervous. If we if we were to go back, and I'm curious to see how that environment would look like. Um, let's see, who else? You can jump in. Um, so inter I'm introduce yourself as well. Oh, I'm Mariah Martin, and I'm a rising senior at Ringling High School. Um, what I've experienced is a lot of missed opportunities but a lot of seeing people go above and beyond and adapt to give us the class of 2021 and the class of 2020 uh, a lot of new opportunities and new ways to do that and so uh, it's been kind of sad to miss some of those opportunities but it just like really shows our classes like how much people really do care for us and how much people want um, the youth to you know better themselves by you know, making it a priority to give us those opportunities and those um, those chances to, you know, prepare ourselves for the next step. Thank you. And before we go on, Kel, would you would you introduce yourself as well? I called on you and didn't give you that chance. Yes, um, my name is Trakel Pinkston, also known as Kel Pinkston. I'm a member, a student at Putnam City High School in the Putnam City School District, and um, I'll be a senior this year, class of 2021. What, what other experiences did you have with distance learning, with uh, the change in finishing the year and this summer even? 
I'll go ahead and jump in. Um, my name is Peyton Watkins. I was, I just completed my senior year at Stillwater High School, so class of 2020. And I felt like a lot of my class, at least the senior class, experienced a lot of loss throughout this because as you go through grade school and up into secondary school, you spend the entire time looking forward to this, this period of your education because it's what you've worked for the whole time and you experience a lot of a lot of grief over what you missed or what you could have had. Um, so I'd say that's the biggest thing that we battled, at least for my grade level. And as far as distance learning, I felt like we had a lot of technological problems. We had to learn how to adapt together to that because none of us had really used it that way before. So that would be what I would say. I'll go ahead and jump in too, if that's all right. Um, my name's Jake Lamis, and I'm from Guyman High School up in the Panhandle of Oklahoma. And I've experienced quite a bit of loss through um, the distance learning. Um, our school district recently gave out Chromebooks um, to all the students in high school. And um, although we have Chromebooks, a lot of the students in our school district don't have access to Wi-Fi. And when, when public facilities shut down, um, there was no way for them to gain access to Wi-Fi. So although there is that distance learning option available, Wi-Fi presents a huge problem. And um, I don't think that, um, I think school should open up. That I mean, it should be up to the student to, to decide whether he, should, he or she should be able to go to school. Um, and I think the state should, should provide, at least provide that opportunity for the students. I agree with you, Jake. I'm Madison Stevens. I'm from Weatherford and I have just graduated high school. One thing that I noticed throughout the shutdown of schools this past year was that there was a large decrease in the value of learning throughout the year and the value of the material that was being brought out and how helpful it was. I go to a top 10 school and Normally our academic material is very rigorous and our students do very well. But even some of my most uh, intense teachers who teach very well and teach honors classes were at a loss of what to do during all of the technology uh, problems that we had. And I think that there are public schools like Epic who are good at what they do already and that some teachers are not prepared to do technology and they're much better in person. And I think that in person is better in any situation. Yeah, thank you for that too. Sean. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sean Keen and I will be a rising senior this year at Charles Page High School in Sand Springs. So my, myself and my friends, uh, we obviously experienced a lot of cancellation, whether that be through things like your advisory council, Dr. Hoffmeister, or sporting events. So we definitely saw a lot of loss, but we also saw, at least our school district, we were able to adapt pretty quickly. So coming off of spring break, um, it was a, a few days, about a week or so after that, and then we were, we were starting to get back on track as far as preparing for AP tests and things of that nature. So my district at least was able to make sure that we stayed on track with our academics. Obviously, um, like Madison, like you said, it, it may not quite have been what we were used to in the classroom, um, but they made sure that we were at least on track. And then outside of school, definitely seen a lot of adaptation. I've been able to participate in some online events and it's been, it's been really neat to see the opportunities that are available to us even as we navigate this online online world. So I've been able to participate in a leadership camp. I've had some friends that have been able to do some online learning sessions to make sure that, that we're still staying involved and, and staying challenged throughout the summer. So, so Sean, what, what you mentioned different ways that that was done. What worked? What was effective for you in that connecting? What, what really, as, as far as in regards to school, um, our administration was super, super open with us about what the expectation was going to be moving forward. And a lot of my teachers and especially my counseling staff were very open and the communication was there. Because I think that's one of the areas where everybody was having trouble because 
uh, especially on the administration side, they were getting questions from all over the place, from teachers, um, from parents, from the students. But um, even throughout that and throughout the volume of, of messages that they were getting, you know, if I had a question regarding, you know, what the AP test was going to look like for my physics teacher, that I was able to get a really quick response, which helped. Uh, obviously, it's not going to replicate that classroom experience of having the teacher there to assist me, but it was at least able to uh, still still gain something from that and still have them as a resource. That's helpful. Thank you. Cademan. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Cademan Brooks. I'm an Epic Charter student, and I'll be a senior this year. Um, <clears throat> so not much has changed for me uh, when it comes to the educational uh, side of things, because all my school is online. Um, so I would say mostly because my summer has been affected with, um, you know, uh, family reunions and uh, church camps and all that. Um, but I definitely feel for um, my fellow students who are in brick and uh, mortar schools who, because, you know, transitioning from brick and mortar school to an all online school or schooling is hard. I went through it um, and it's definitely, you know, like it's hard at the beginning, but, um, you know, overall, um, you'll get used to it. I mean, Maybe not, you know, um, but yeah, it's definitely hard and I feel for everybody who's had to do that. that that's a really interesting point um, that you've experienced even advanced before COVID, that transition to uh, all virtual. So thank, thank you, Caden. Cademan, uh, Nick. Nick. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Nick Sayeg, and I graduated from Western Heights High School this past year. And um, I kind of have the same story that Cademan has, as I was a virtual concurrent student at Oklahoma State University here in Oklahoma City. And so nothing really much changed for me regarding my academics. But what I witnessed was just I had a lot of um, optimism about how school districts were handling the younger students um, and providing that hope for them, because um, obviously a kindergartner wouldn't really understand what's going on in these unprecedented times. And also the social services and the meals they provided for students was um, excellent because a lot of the students in low socioeconomic backgrounds really rely on the school district for their free and reduced lunch programs. And I think that going forward, as we enter the 2020-2021 um, school year, that providing these social necessary social programs and obviously um, food programs would be very um, beneficial for lots of Oklahomans and public schools. Thank you. I, I'm very curious, you know, how you felt just experiencing this. And um, I know Peyton, you've got, uh, you've got a comment, uh, but I'm also interested in that if, if you can share as well, but please go ahead. Absolutely. Uh, that actually kind of ties into what I was going to say. So in our last meeting with our bigger council, I kind of talked about how a lot of us felt a loss of control. Whenever you're a student, especially in today's day and age, you get a lot of choices. Choose what classes you take, how you execute certain things. Things are really up to you for the most part. Um, and whenever we switch to distance learning, we kind of lost that. And my district put forth an effort to give us some control by allowing seniors to make some choices, which was really helpful. Um, but I think that way that we could incorporate that into the future would be having a more open line of communication between administrators and students when making policies. A lot of times they forget to consult us. And as Mrs. Hoffmeister said at one point, I remember she said that who better knows what students need than students. So maybe sending out surveys, talking to your students before you make policies and letting that weigh in a little bit so that you can get the best idea of what is beneficial for both the school and the students and get that exchange of ideas. That's, that's really great. Thank you for, for just sharing practically and as well how, how um, your feelings were impacted by those, those things we did or didn't do. Appreciate that. Uh, Cal? Yes, um, kind of just to backtrack a little bit, my bad about that. Uh, one of the other issues that I did see is uh, with distance learning. Uh, the fact that it doesn't allow us to learn a few more of the essential things that we need that are not implemented in our curriculum, uh, like how to work in different classroom environments. And if you're anything like me, uh, you need to be around people and you also love to be around people. And that's kind of how I operate on a daily basis. 
Yeah, that you, you're bringing up the the that total impact of the school experience with peers, with um, even sometimes just different leadership and instructional styles of teachers that that you have to kind of navigate. I, I appreciate that, um, Mariah. Um, so I didn't experience this personally, but in talking to um, some of the, my counselors and teachers, uh, what they were really concerned with was kids that don't have a very good home life that come to school as an escape or come to school, you know, they need that school interaction um, for their mental health, not just their education. And so that was a problem that we saw a lot in our school district was just the disconnect with the teachers and the counselors and not being able to have access to that in-person communication. Um, I know I spoke to my counselor and she said that some of the kids came back and they just weren't themselves. They weren't who she saw, you know, because they're missing that interaction and that that care and, you know, um, just, just that interaction of being at school and knowing somebody cares and knowing somebody's trying to, you know, push you to be better um, because they don't always have that at home when they go back. So that was a big concern that we saw with how people felt in my district. Mm. And you're bringing up that important mental health aspect too. So very, Zeeler. I see Zeeler. Yes. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Yeah, uh, my name is Zeeler Chow. I'm a graduating senior from Norman North High School. Um, really quickly, like before I say something more, I want to give a big shout out to all the teachers who have adapted so well to the COVID-19 pandemic, especially my teachers. Um, I know they worked really hard. Like, for example, my English teacher um, personally uh, drove around and mailed us like our graded essays uh, back to us during the pandemic. And um, my debate teacher made several like 20 minute long videos and posted them up on YouTube as sort of like a lecture and a more engaging activity for us to see. Um, you know, they put in a lot of work, but you know, sometimes during COVID backing off what uh, Mariah said, we do experience a lot of mental like illnesses and mental health, like depression and stress among these times. So a lot of these uh, things that like, you know, when teachers post assignments on Google Classroom or post video lectures for us to see, it might not work the best and students might not have the, um, uh, they might not have the drive to go view those. Um, what I did find that worked, however, was when teachers hosted some Google Hangouts or Zoom meetings. And when we had a more like engaging class lecture and discussion, when students got to like, you know, just talk and have a conversation with their classmates, have a conversation with their teacher, not necessarily about the school subject, but also learning some more um, I felt like that was what uh, worked the most. And uh, yeah, so I just really wanted to give that point out there. Really, really, that's very practical. I think that's really helpful as we um, continue answering questions. Uh, so uh, Jake and Perla, think about what you saw that really worked or a concern you have. Yeah. I have I have some to add to what you're saying there, Mr. or Ms. Hoffmeister. Um, w w when you said what what worked, we um, I only had one teacher that um, I I took a class from that did an online learning, and that was U.S. government. Um, I'm a graduated senior from Garmin. I forgot to mention that. And he, he would post, um, like he would assign videos, and um, he would post those videos in in a video that he would upload to the class to Google Classroom. And so that way, if you couldn't, like if you didn't have access to YouTube, but you had access to Google Classroom, you could watch the video through Google Classroom. Um, and uh, since our school district doesn't really have um, a, a lot of Wi-Fi access, I think maybe something that just came to my mind was maybe mailing um, the school assignments uh, via, well, physical mail. And maybe that that could help. Um, and if we could work something out with the state mailing department, or I don't I don't know if there's a, a way we can work that out or not. Uh, uh, thank you. I mean, the um, these are these are really helpful uh, and practical considerations. Um, it and when you think about you know you're you're a lot of you are talking about the high school experience and being able to put things on YouTube. Um, you may have siblings or know of um, those younger students as well. And uh, be sure you're feel free. You do not have to speak only to your experience. Um, but if you have 
um, an understanding of what that's like as well in some of our younger grade levels. I think that's helpful too. Um, and then Perla, as, uh, as we're kind of thinking about um, looking forward to the next year and um, as the last semester wrapped up, uh, what concerns you, Perla, as, as you kind of lessons learned or how we could improve on that? My name is Pearl Tovar. Good morning, everyone. I am from, I just graduated from Binney High School. And one of my main concerns is I have a younger brother and a younger sister. And during the pandemic, um, I got to join them while they video chat their classmates and all that good stuff. Which my brother is in kindergarten. And it's just, it just opened our eyes to see how important school is. And it just, they don't get to interact with these kids. They don't get to like grow and uh, learn with them. And it was just, it was different. And I really, I don't know, like I can't imagine myself not going through my younger ages of uh, learning in school. Um, and I don't know how much longer this pandemic is gonna last, but um, they're very much missing out on a lot of opportunities um, and they would do anything to be back with their classmates. Um, so yeah, I'm like just really concerned about that. Uh, my other sibling, she's in junior high and she's just looking forward uh, to playing sports again and um, all of this right now. <laughs> we don't know how it's gonna look in the future, so. Uh, I believe you're still on mute. I was muted. Sorry about that. Okay. So as um, you know, let, let's go ahead and um, flip to that next slide. Several of you graduated this spring. So how did the disruption of the end of the school year change things for you in terms of graduation or your plans after graduation? And we won't spend too much time on this because we've got some other things I want to be sure to get to. Maybe just two. Um, of I'll just jump on. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So uh, I actually just graduated this past weekend, but on our actual graduation day, I actually planned a um, parade graduation and it was super cool. They want to make it a tradition now. And we just, we had all our teachers uh, lined up and friends and family. It was really nice. But um, our, the pandemic, we didn't get to have like our senior trip, um, our senior walk and a lot of things we got, we had to miss out on, but I will say that this pandemic has definitely made our class stronger. And uh, I know my school tried to do whatever they could, but there, we just really didn't have a control on anything with the pandemic, so. And you got creative. It sounds like you, was it helpful? Like, did your school say, let's get the students involved in doing this? Did that make a difference? Or did others have experiences where you just heard news and decisions were made? Thank you. Um, uh, how, Peyton? Yes, so um, I'm kind of going to bring up the whole communication thing again because I felt like that was something my school was actually lacking in this, this time around. Usually they're really great about it, but I was very disappointed in the way our school board handled things for our graduation. Uh, it still hasn't happened yet. It's supposed to happen July 24th, but as far as the planning and decision making, like they didn't really take any consideration into what the students wanted as far as we had a venue that would fit many more of our family members they went with the smaller venue because we don't know why <laughs> many of us communicated with them tried to email them and that line of communication wasn't great that being said there were certainly people advocating for the students best interest but didn't work out that way so i i think communication is really a, a big a big thing communicating with the students on what they want for something as big as commencement that's already kind of being taken over by the pandemic and being changed. Communication is a really big aspect for that. 
that's a great reminder for all of us. Um, Madison, is that your experience? Do you share that? Actually, my school in Weatherford found out a great way to have graduation in June. And we had it out on the football field. And if people were not comfortable, they could stay in the stands. They could bring their lawn chairs and just sit with their own group of people. And we still had the opportunity to give our speeches. And it all worked out very well. And the weather was great. So I think if everyone really tries hard enough, we can figure out ways to make things meaningful because it's that in-person meaningful uh, experience that is important for those first and last kind of events that you have going through high school. And I was very appreciative to my school district for making an effort to do that in person. Excellent, thank you. That's really good feedback. Nick. Yeah, so uh, my district kind of did like a hybrid online uh, in-person type thing back in April. Um, uh, everything was very socially distant. I felt very safe and I'm sure uh, many of the other students did as well. But I think that um, the transition between high school and uh, post-secondary education is where are the, I think there's a bigger gap there than us just missing out on a commencement ceremony, which I'm sure I can speak for the entire class of 2020 that, yeah, we all wanted to do it. But I think that these school districts putting in um, different ways, whether it be virtual or in-person now when it's um, a little bit later into the pandemic. I think that's uh, great for the students. But um, like some of the other students have said, communication was a real big issue, I think, for my district, just because not necessarily that they weren't communicating, that they did know something, but I mean, this is obviously times we've never seen before, so nobody really knows anything. And plans can change the next day, depending on what you know research says and what science has come back to us from, from the state. But going on to post-secondary education, for me, um, I've had to do all my orientation online uh, virtual, which I'm sure many of other, other students will have to do the same as well. And as a first generation student, it's really gonna be a, a bigger leap into um, post-secondary education as I've never experienced anything like it. And I'm sure many other first generation students have it as well. That's a very interesting point. Um, it is a transition to another step that is also done differently than even um, it, anyone's done before. So, you know, thanks for pointing that out as well. You know, Kel, I think you, you wrote some things in the chat that I think would be really important for people to hear you say in case they can't see our chat. Um, and they may not be able to if they're, if they're following live. Um, just would you give your uh, remarks um, some, uh, I think specifically about your words about counselors? Yes. So um, as I put in the chat, um, I, I know of two people who have committed suicide in the past two years, all being students in Oklahoma schools, and one being a close relative uh, who committed suicide last year in 2019. And one thing that I've observed is uh, though I'm able to go to my school counselors uh, in times of need, they're, they're not always available and I'm not always uh, able to have a, a long conversation with them because they're more than uh, they're more likely to counsel our academic needs. And uh, there's a lot of other things like getting testing ready um, that they have to put before us. So I would really like to see school psychologists more known in our public school systems. You know, you're bringing up a point that we, we do recognize is just really lacking. And we need to have more counselors, licensed professional counselors in our schools, as well as academic counselors. I mean, of course, um, that, that's, that's a very important component that, that um, the Office of Counseling contributes and gives to students. Um, what, what do you think about this effort that um, I'm working on with, the, with DHS? Um, to they have a goal and we're really working together to have school-based social workers so that, that there are those connections to um, that support safety network and getting those resources, but also coming alongside our school counselors as well and being embedded in the school. What do you think of that? I, I think that that would be um, something great to be implemented into our school systems. Uh, and I say it because I, uh, 
a lot of the times we as students have to help counsel our friends and we rely on each other to help with our everyday needs. And I know I also had a friend who attempted to this school year and uh, he went to like, like two counselors because, you know, they both ran out of time. And then he also went to our resource officer and then one of our principals. And then it still didn't satisfy his needs. And he had to end up going to the hospital this year. So I think that that would be very good. And I think it would be very beneficial to our schools. Well, and you speak for many when you describe that, because we know that based on the um, needs assessment that is done by the mental health office, um, we, we have seen the um, moderate to severe uh, depression in our state um, go as high among students, sixth through 12th grade, as um, 81%. And it has, uh, the last time that we have results on our testing um, was for 2017. And those results showed um, that it had dropped to 75%, but still 75% of our sixth through 12th graders are, are suffering from depression. And there are many reasons for that. But I, I do worry about this with that disconnect that we have with social distancing, the isolation. Um, so it, it is, it, what do you think of that, um, Nicholas? What's on your mind, Nick? Yeah, I think um, Trakel brings up a great point, but as, especially as we enter this virtual world, I think it's going to get even worse because, you know, students are isolated and they may not have great family lives because a lot of students, um, either I've personally seen in my district, use their school and their friends and their teachers as a way to escape that at-home life that may not be so comfortable. And I think that going forward, um, and even after post-pandemic, once we're all returning to in-school classes like we usually are, um, so specifically for my district, you know, I feel like I'm, there's a lack of um, obviously social workers, but there's an excess of security and police officers just um, policing students. And obviously um, they need to be present to resolve issues. But what I'm more concerned about is stopping those problems before they originate, like getting these social workers in elementary schools and teaching students like, the morals and respect and values they're supposed to have as they go through um, education instead of just forcing that on high school students who have been used to acting however they want for the rest or for as thus far going through um, primary and secondary education. And I think that we have to think about the lives outside of the classroom for some of these students, which is um, could be very good, but could also be very uh, negative for the students. Right. And I know Mariah, you you you've got your hand raised as well, and and I want I want to hear that. And as we kind of we're, we're really shifting to that next question in this conversation, where you know you were affected by the statewide move to distance learning that ended the school year uh, last year. So you know let's let's continue to think about this. How did it impact your peers? And um, what do you suggest that schools and teachers do in the coming year with that in mind? Mariah, can you speak to any of that? Um, so I actually have the awesome opportunity to work at my school's after school program for our elementary kids. And a lot of the kids that you see come there are those kids that don't come from such good homes. And, you know, that's really, you know, you worry about high school students having that disconnect. Yeah. But like Kel said, you know, we can kind of, you know, it's not always uh, sufficient, but we can kind of rely on each other and we have cell phones and, you know, like ways to get in touch. But those elementary kids are kind of going home to isolation with just you know their parents and hopefully you know they have siblings or parents or someone that they're around that they can talk to but a lot of them really don't and one thing that we did we usually have a summer program where uh, the school the kids that go to the after school program they can come to the summer program you know they can get their food and uh, have the in-person connection throughout the summer but we didn't get to have that this year uh, but one thing we really we did and I thought it was a really good idea is we had a virtual summer program. And so we kind of had a two way approach to it. So I know they handed out um, packets and supplies and stuff. Um, and they gave it to all the kids that were gonna participate throughout the summer. And then every day myself and a few others would post, you know, science videos, um, uh, P videos, interactive videos. So it was virtual, but they also had that in-person component of, they had, you know, something like textual that they could they could use with the video. So it wasn't just a virtual deal, it was still kind of interactive. And I thought that was a really good way to keep 
elementary students engaged because you know the virtual thing isn't always the greatest for them. Mm. So we've got to be flexible. We've got to adapt. Sounds like you're saying as well. Then, um, and we have to be really creative in doing that. So, you know, let's kind of really shift to something just as weighty. Um, we've talked about the spring, and now you know here we are in the summer, and we have all watched as our nation has grappled with reckoning on the painful legacy of systemic racism. I'm curious how you think racial and ethnic identity and systematic racism, racism affect the student experience. Um, and what should schools do differently? Can I jump in on this? Yes. Okay, so I, I come from a school where um, white people are minority. I'm half white and half Asian Indian. And so I'm kind of, I've got a very objective standpoint on this. Um, as far as my own race goes. Um, I think that, uh, uh, well, we have a large Hispanic population in our town because we have a, a, a food processing plant and a lot of, um, a lot of families uh, work there. And, and that- You're in that Woodward, right? Say, yeah. You're in Woodward, right? Uh, Guymon. Guymon, excuse me, Guymon, yes. Yes, ma'am. And- and really, we, our school doesn't, I don't see our school struggling um, with racism a whole lot. Um, I mean, a lot of, a lot of the students kind of find a brotherhood and, and sisterhood in, in their own, in their own classrooms. And so um, they pat it on each other's back and, you know, it's, there's a very uh, family oriented environment in my school, in my school. And I think if we, uh, focus on on racism too much um, we we could make that um, I think we need to be aware of it but I don't think we should force it down students throats because if we do that we're going to indoctrinate them we need to we need to teach them how to think for themselves um, I've had some excellent teachers do that for me and and I think the best way to do that is to ask students questions that provoke them to think and critical thinking is is vital to um, to students and it's a it's a super valuable resource as you go into the world and, and navigate around decisions because if you're trying to think one way then I believe that um, if you're not challenged you're you may not change your viewpoint. So um, I think making, if I, I know that I read the chat on, on a previous meeting we've had as a student advisory council, and there have been voices say that we should teach uh, or have a, a state core in, in, in racism. And um, I don't know how long that would last, but I think maybe it would be, um, that would provide a grounds for indoctrination. So I'll step up. I, I think it's really helpful too, just hearing your perspective. And so remind everyone as we go through this again, where you're located, um, it'll help. Raya, you're up. Um, so I talked about this a little bit in our last meeting. I come from Ringling, Oklahoma, which is a small uh, school in Southern Oklahoma. And as I looked around my classroom, you know, I saw people who looked like myself and um, I saw all my classmates, they looked like me, like we'd never been exposed to people who believe different, who looked different. Um, and as I went out and I started going to these places and these meetings, I met all these wonderful people who were nothing like myself. And it kind of got me thinking, um, so we have financial literacy, you know, and kind of to say what Jake was saying, why don't we have communication literacy? Because I know my classmates and I know they say things sometimes that, you know, could be racist and but I know they have a good heart. And I know when people come into our school and they get to know them and those people are different than themselves, they treat them just the same. But it's more so they're, you know, that way towards people that they don't understand and that they don't know. And so if we could have a communication literacy, um, cause that's really something we're lacking is the ability to have the hard conversations because we don't know how, and we don't know how to agree with someone who doesn't agree with us. Um, and so, you know, we have financial literacy in our classrooms. So why don't we have communication literacy to teach us to have these hard conversations so that we can, um, you know, get to understand people who aren't like us and maybe not fear them so much. That, so I just have to ask you, so when you were ex 
you know, you, you described you were exposed to, you know, now you're in a new setting and there's people who don't look like you, who don't believe like you. How did you bridge that? Um, so I just, uh, thankfully I have teachers um, and I actually was involved in this thing called Ethics Bowl, which like Jake said, you know, challenged me to think openly, to have an open mind. And so I always went into it with a very open mind and open perspective of, you know, they, it kind of ethics bowl taught me that people don't have to agree with me. People don't have to believe the same way as me. And that doesn't mean they're wrong. And that doesn't mean I'm wrong. It just means, you know, there's different ways to look at things. There's different perspectives. And um, it taught me, you know, the value of those perspectives. And yes, you know, I believe what I believe, but there's value in what the other person believes. And I can learn from that and I can, you know, build my beliefs off that. So Coming from Ethics Bowl, um, which my wonderful teacher, Ms. Howard, I think she's watching this, uh, she really, she brought that to our school. And that's been the difference maker for me is, you know, being educated and having those hard conversations and um, being able to have an open mind because of what I've been taught. So that's why I think communication literacy would be a really, really effective way to do that. Thanks. Thanks, Moran. Nick. So I come from um, kind of the same background as Jake. I went to Western Heights High School here in Oklahoma City, which is an inner city, um, mostly low demographic school. But I was always surrounded by different beliefs and different races and different ethnicities. So I don't really think the students, um, I don't, I'm sure I can speak for other schools in like the Oklahoma City Public School District um, here in the inner city school district system where diversity isn't really an issue, but the problem that a lot of students face is whenever we um, progress through the standard curriculum that the state imposes upon these school districts, there's um, little to no representation of um, black and indigenous and then people of color like literature and um, culture and religion and um, all the ethnic backgrounds and stuff like that, rather than the standard, like obviously like MLK, Rosa Parks, stuff that is um, common knowledge. Um, but it would really feel comfortable for uh, me and I'm sure I speak for other students to see um, more stories of people who look like and act like I do. Very good. That's that's really specific. Thank you. Kel. Yes, I honestly do believe that systemic racism does uh, is, is still around in many different aspects in the education system. Uh, for one, I was born and partially raised in Clinton, Oklahoma, and uh, I moved here in the second grade. And while I did experience a huge cultural shock, um, I did realize that there are limited uh, opportunities to help advance people of color, maybe, or even Hispanic people who may speak Ebonics or, you know, broken English to where they can uh, help advance their, their grammar or their communication skills. And then secondly, uh, in the uh, past student advisory meeting, we talked about, uh, well, I put in the comment section of uh, redlining, which is uh, effect that I brought up happens at, even with Millwood Public Schools. After talking to their superintendent, she was telling me how uh, a similar school district with one, uh, 100 less students, uh, they get about $1 million more in funding each year. Um, so I think that is an effect that isn't necessarily guided by people who are um, in office today or, you know, uh, administrating us today, but it is something that was put in effect long ago and it has not been taken care of yet. So then you're describing changes that need to happen both in legislation or in uh, public policy. Do, can well, you define redlining for all of those watching? Yes, so um, I know little about it, but, but uh, I watched the video before the last meeting and it's about where uh, basically there were a few neighborhoods within, uh, you know, ac across the nation, honestly, in different cities where they would redline the, the poor um, populations. And uh, it would affect where they go to school, what loans they could get, and, uh, you know, just basically the type of life they were able to live. And that still goes in effect today. I say, even though we do not redline, I don't believe, uh, places like Millwood are still getting that effect or, you know, feeling that effect. And it's going directly to the students. Um, and, you know, my school, Putnam City High School, we're going one-on-one -on -one in the high school this year with iPads. I don't see them getting that same opportunity, even though they have less students. I see. 
great. Really, we've had some really good comment. I want to come um, to uh, some who've had their hands up for a while. Um, I think uh, Cademan. Okay, um, so I have three points here. And the first one is about history. And you know, I'm a big history guy. Um, I like studying history um, whenever I have the chance. And I think a great way um, we can improve people's mindsets and just the educational system in general is to show both sides of history. Um, you know, you, we can use Christopher, Christopher Columbus, for example. We learned that um, he found the Americas um, and all, um, all that good stuff. But we don't, we don't learn about the bad stuff. Or if we do, it's maybe, you know, a small 10-minute session about it. Um, so I think if we really just open up our educational system to both sides on every subject, I think that would help improve, um, you know, because people's mindsets. The second would be, you know, once again, you know, proper funding for each district, um, no matter your demographic or anything like that. Um, and then the third is just simple respect towards other people you might have disagreements with and just people in general. Um, you know, because nobody is born racist. Um, it's something you either grow up with or have a mindset with. And we have to do our very best to help show people um, that, hey, simple respect is how you should um, go about things, no matter what it is. Those are those are really good and 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 speak to that. What do we do, um, Nicholas? Yeah, I just wanted to um, comment off of what Trill and both came and said about the um, disproportionate inequality that. Um, actually does have to do with race because a lot of the a majority of low demographic um, families here in Oklahoma City, I'm not sure what the rest of the state looks like, but are um, people of color. And you can see that the opportunities for the students who attend low socioeconomic school districts are drastically different than what would be if I attended a well-funded, properly functioning school district. For example, um, like chemistry labs, you can go to a school that has adequate funding, which has, act, you know, like scientific experiments and um, all of the stuff that a student would need to develop that passion for chemistry, which would push them on through post-secondary education, a completely different career um, versus a school who's underfunded and chemistry just looks like textbook and worksheets who eventually would like fall out of a passion, which would otherwise develop. And I think that can apply to many different fields of interest in um, public schools, like such as like technology, um, is depriving these students of a future, rather. Thank you. And I know, Sean, you've had your hand up for a while. Um, so I attend Charles Page High School in Sand Springs, which is a, a suburb of Tulsa. We're just 15 or 20 minutes out. So um, this hi history of Tulsa with the, the race massacre of 1921 has, was a large part of the curriculum that we had growing up. Um, throughout the school system. We started it around freshman year in high school. So that's a conversation that we have. And I know a lot of the schools uh, that surround Tulsa continue to have because it, it, those, it does, still does affect uh, the Greenwood district. Uh, there's a lot of rich history there. I think what all of us have been hitting, especially in every other area, is the opportunity for students to drive the conversation. And so I know my administration has done a really good job with that. They've, we have a free period uh, every week so our, our, our classes get restructured a little bit. And so it builds an extra hour into our day. And, and during that hour, our administration and our teachers allow students to, to meet with different clubs and different activities. And, and any student led club can meet during that hour as long as they have a teacher sponsor. And so what that's allowed our student body to do is to attend different, uh, different group meetings and, and learn more from students and I think that that's a really um, approachable way to start that conversation, as well as a very realistic approach, because well, you know, whenever we're talking about things, there's obviously funding limitations. Uh, there's limitations as far as legislation and, and changing some of these things, curriculum. And those are all long-term projects to work towards. But the, you know, this is a uh, administration providing the opportunity for students to lead the conversation and, and educate one another is something that, that I think is, is pretty reasonable. Oh, that's powerful too, to think of just the difference in your schedule that can foster that kind of opportunity to talk and connect and understand and be heard. That's, that's really great. Okay, so um, Madison, I'm gonna call on you. I wanna tell everybody watching, we're gonna stretch this just a little bit. We have a cushion 
uh, before that next session starts. So um, I'm also gonna ask um, uh, our, our team to start looking at some of those questions and things put in the chat so we can also turn to answering some of the audience questions. Madison. Thank you. So one thing that I noticed that I think we really need to be careful of is that I think it's sad that we have categorized and generalized teachers to be a part of systemic racism across Oklahoma because we have such a caring and great group of teachers. And I think during generalizations, we all need to be very careful of who we accuse because I think that must be on a district to district basis. And that's something I'm sure that is a problem in some areas. And that is a conversation that needs to be had, but we absolutely cannot characterize our teachers as that because they have done a great job. And one more thing is I think part of the problem is just starts with a heart and a service to others, which is something that I think our counselors did a really great job on teaching bullying and being kind whenever we were all in elementary school. And I think maybe that's a problem that can start with good counseling rather than public policies that just open up more venues for indoctrination, no matter what views you believe. So I think also the other part that I see is more of a problem is the difference between low income levels as far as disadvantages go. I mean, one of my friends, she had no time for sports, hardly had time to study because she had to work 30 to 40 hour work weeks just to keep up with all of the bills. And she's an inspiration to me. She made it with Oklahoma's Promise and is in college and she's doing great. But I think that's something that's more of an issue in our school districts right now. And I also think that we do need to work on our history because really most of it hasn't been portrayed in depth, which is hard, but we could offer some more history classes and uh, more further education as far as that goes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Mariah, real quick, and we'll start our first live um, question, but go ahead with your comments. You've had your hand up. Um, okay, so I think what we're all basically coming to is education is the key. And I don't think it's necessarily, you know, we're not trying to generalize teachers and say, that, you know, that they're involved in systemic racism, but they really are, um, you know, there are educators and education is key. And so they're in a really prime position to be able to teach the things like having, you know, a, a serving heart and um, an open mind and things of that nature. Um, so I think because, uh, you know, we all talked about we need to have those things. But a lot of us have probably maybe grown up with parents or someone who influenced us to be that way. And because like, I think Cademan said it, nobody's born racist, nobody's born biased. You know, you have to form those biases as you grow. And um, elementary teachers, especially high school teachers, you know, they can be really influential on their students. And so education is the key to it. And I think that's just what we've all kind of come to the consensus of is, you know, education needs to be involved in furthering that change. Very good. Thank you for those. And that's a really great way to um, close out that piece unless there's more uh, that comes from our um, guests that are with us with live questions. Again, we're just gonna stretch this just a few more minutes, but uh, Steffi or Phil, do you have a question that you can uh, bring to the panel from our um, guests that are following? Well, uh, yes, uh, the superintendent, there, uh, going back to an earlier topic, there were some questions about uh, asking what the experience was with your respective districts and schools with uh, Chromebooks and if technology was provided uh, and how that worked out this past spring and, and uh, going forward. Uh, Marian? Did you have your hand up or? Sorry, I couldn't get it unmuted. Um, so my school, uh, it's low social economic or whatever. We don't get a ton of funding. And so while we have Chromebooks in the school, it's kind of for all the classrooms to use. And so we couldn't just hand those out to students. So what I experienced coming from a small school in Southern Oklahoma is 
we didn't have technology. We don't have kids who have access to Wi-Fi. You know, there's a probably a small percentage of us that actually do. And so technology wasn't really an option that we had. So that's what I experienced with it. We didn't really get to have, you know, we, we had group me's for my high school classes because all of us have cell phones. Um, but especially for the elementary students, the disconnect was huge because they didn't have those technologies to keep them connected. All right, and uh, thank you, Peyton. All right, I was having some trouble getting it unmuted. So my district has Chromebooks and when we're in building and doing regular learning, we're able to check them out from the library on a classroom basis. So an entire set for a classroom. Um, we're not financially at a point where we can be on a one-to-one -one basis. So what our school did was they checked out Chromebooks individually to students during distance learning who needed them and worked with local internet providers to provide hotspots for those students because they can't use their Chromebook without internet and many of them who didn't have access needed both. So they kind of battled that in that way and most of us found it to be very beneficial just from speaking to other peers and things of that nature. And Peyton, while you're you're still um, got the mic, would you share what you put in the small group chat of the panel about racism? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what I typed in the chat was, I think one of the biggest ways we could begin to combat systematic racism is by having a willingness to learn and listen to those being negatively impacted or oppressed by systematic racism. I'm Native American, but I don't look it. And even then I would never fully understand or have to go through what people of color do. It's my responsibility to listen and learn, and the fight to end systematic racism begins with educating yourself that there's a problem. I think many of us would do well to remember that. I can't think of a better way to say that, and, and it is such an inspiration to have that said from our students. I appreciate you so much. Um, and then I think um, uh, we're just going to go ahead and wrap up now, and I want you to uh, give us that one thing that you would encourage teachers to do as they think about the next school year. Um, I don't know if you can fashion your answer, Caden, you've had your hand up, but I'm going to start with you. Looking forward, what, what do our teachers need to know? Um, I would say um, our teachers just need to be more open to teaching past uh, what's in the curriculum, whether it be in history or any other subject, um, and to teach both sides of it, um, really just open up the student's mindset and allow them to have multiple perspectives. And I really do think that would help improve um, many different subjects. Um, that's what I would say. Thank you. And Nick? Well, I think everything we've discussed today has been very beneficial to educators in our state, but um, what I would like to see as like a final piece of advice, I guess, is to have a unified staff against whatever issue we're facing and not have any internal disagreements that could be confusing, especially for younger students. So, I mean, obviously we need to be very safe during the pandemic if we're returning to school in person or hybrid model, whatever the case may be. And then when combating systemic racism, I think if the entire staff was unified against a common goal, it would be very beneficial and effective to eliminating these common problems. Yeah, I totally agree with Nick, and I totally agree with everything that was said before. Um, I think that a good way that teachers can go forward from here on out is to make sure that, you know, everyone is getting the support that they needed because, uh, you know, when we do engage in virtual online learning, sometimes students may feel a little bit more like distanced and maybe they keep their cameras off and mics muted the whole time or maybe they don't join in on those meetings so I just think that uh, as we go into the next year we should put you know mental health and mental illnesses more on the top priority as we further into um, our next education. Really really key. Um, who else can close a uh, couple last comments. Um, Perla are you do you have so, uh, something on your mind? Yeah, um, I just think that teachers need to remember talk how really, it is. We, we have a hard time hearing you for some reason. So talk, project if you uh, can. Okay, hopefully you guys can hear me, but I just want to remind teachers for the upcoming school year uh, to remember how important it is to stay connected with students. Um, I know 
I just graduated and I don't know where I would be at right now if it wasn't for my teachers being my mentor, for being my support system. And I, I just want teachers to realize how much of an impact they make and how helpful they are. And so even though school may be virtual this year, to, I know that we did have a lack of communication um, this past semester, and I hope that they will stay connected individually with e every student, which I know that's a lot to ask for with many students, but I know teachers uh, will find a way to do that, so. Thank you, Jake. Okay, um, you kind of got me on the spot there. I was just about to send you a message. Um, mm -hmm. I like to remind everybody that I'm from Guyman High School in the Panhandle um, and our teachers are doing an excellent job. Shout out to the Guyman School District and all of our administration. Um, they're doing a great job in connecting to the students. Um, communication is is top notch up here and um, they're, I think in order to um, address these issues we need to have the relationships with the students and if um, a, a professional development um, tip may be um, to look into capturing kids hearts that's something that our administration has adopted and it's um, it's doing wonders in 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 our district there's a lot of stubborn teachers out there um, not just in our school district but across the nation and capturing kids hearts is I've seen teachers start to break down their stubbornness and start to be loving and more kind to other students and that that helps cultivate a, a, a better relationship all right and we are running out of time and I can see four hands still up so can you give one word of encouragement what what are what do teachers need to bring their students and if you can make it one word, I'm, I'll ask um, Sean. Final thing is just a, a large thank you. Just this year, just keep bringing the same intensity, keep bringing the same love for the students that you guys have because throughout it all, it's not going unnoticed. We're seeing it and, and thank you. Thanks. Um, just know how appreciated you are and how influential, influential you are. It's easy to lose your passion for teaching in such times like this, but y'all really do make a difference. And y'all are the reason all of us are stand, like sitting here right now talking about these things so eloquently and so intelligently. Uh, Madison? Thank you so much for being fun and engaging and try your best to see your students in person. It makes such a difference. And the final word from Peyton. Support would be the word I would choose. Just don't forget to check in on your students. This is really trying times for all of us. And I have had teachers that do that. And I know personally, Dr. Brown at the high school has saved multiple students just by checking in. So don't forget to do that. Awesome. All right. Well, we could have talked for another two hours and we were just getting started, but thanks so much to our fantastic set of panelists. And you inspire us. You are the reason we do what we do. I hope everybody has a great conference and a great day. Thanks so much, everybody.